All right, so here we have the finalized project, and uh, you're fixing to see a limitation of XML here, and that's this price sorting. You're going to notice it's a little bit off. These are being sorted by price, 000, 200, okay, but then 2900 and then $299, what gives here? Uh, in programming, this is called the natural language problem, and that is the computers do not speak a natural language. Instead, they're seeing these zeros here as nothingness. So as far as they're concerned, nothing, 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 then basically 2, 2, then 29, then 299. So they're sorting these things in a way they seem to be correct, but when you get down here to $79, you can see that this really isn't how we want to sort it. Um, and in XML, I don't know how to solve the natural sorting language problem, uh, nor do I really care for that matter. But it is something you have to be aware of on occasion, is that certain languages do this style of... Um, of uh, sorting and you have to be aware because you will get unexpected results like this but that's its best guess at what the price is. Next we got software by OSX and you can see here it's more or less doing the same thing it's just figuring out that L comes before M and then finally went Mac and Windows. Right? So that's its way of sorting. It's not the best algorithm in the world but what do you expect? It's a basic text editor so let's go into the code here and see what I did. Probably the most annoying thing about XML is that you must precisely match everything. And it does not give you any error um, if you mess something up. It simply doesn't do what it is you want it to do. So let's start off with our XML. And I've went ahead and I've created both an OS. So these are attribute properties here. When I hover over it, it does tell me that yes, that's an attribute. And it's of data type C data, which is just character data. And it keeps going on and does the same thing and the same thing. And then right here, I actually got new elements, and they're of type PC data or parse character data. So basically text, fancy way of saying that. So Eclipse is trying to help me out here and give me some clue as to what my stuff is, which will help me with my document type declaration. But notice that I need to make sure that if I spell software like this, it must be spelled like that inside of here. And it must be spelled like that. Just throwing errors now, but there's no real error. It must be spelled like that here and here, otherwise it will um, go crazy on me. Or crazier. Um, Eclipse does not handle XML particularly great. But we do have our handy XPath expression here. Now another gotcha, or kind of like a thing you got to really be watching out for, is that in here your XPath um, begins with this little slash operator, which basically says start from the root, right? That's what the first slash is, is beginning from root, work your way on down through it, find softwares, then software, and then find anything that matches the attribute of OS right here. However, when we switch over to our XSL, we declare that right here. We declare we're starting from root. So when we actually do our sorting, we no longer put that forward slash or it will not display correctly. Now when we start running our for each loop, we now start off from software software. So whenever we do our select, we're doing it on price. And then name OS and price. We don't put the full path in here. Otherwise, they would think we're searching on software software and then software software price. And that wouldn't match anything. Um, I've gone ahead and styled this slightly. Um, it's all inline style, or in this case, even the more dreaded using HTML styling. But that's um, just part and parcel for doing something this simple. We begin it with a for each loop, which selects software software. Then we run through that loop. So back in our XML, we start off here. That's retrieving a list of everything. And then we have the choice of how we want to get the element or do we want to get the attribute. And I went ahead and did both of them just for demonstration purposes. So if you're choosing to use the, the element name convention, then you just select whatever that next element is. When we get to the OS sorting, it's the same for each loop. And that for each loop um, is terminated right here. So that ends the for each loop. So that's the closing tag right there. We start up a new one, same selection, but this time we're sorting on the attributes, so attribute OS. I didn't add an attribute called name, so there's none of that, but then attribute OS pricing category. And again, whenever we look at it, we see that it works out about as well as can be expected. So then 
um, in our document type declaration, which is going to go a little bit crazy again, you start off by declaring whether it's an element or an attribute. So this is the attribute declaration and this is the element declaration. So I'm saying that the element softwares has one child software and this plus operator is saying there can be more than one of them. So if you don't have this, it's going to throw an error because it's going to be saying you have multiple uh, children called software. With the plus, it says as many of these as I want. Next up, we have software, so that's the direct child. And inside of it, it has the children name, OS, price, and category. And there's no plus here because I'm only having one name, one OS, one price, and one data. Just like we saw with uh, Eclipse's little pop t up tooltip, the attributes they carry are um, PC data, which is just, you know, text. Then our attribute, it's sort of the same thing, except for here, my attribute is going to be software, and the software um, element will have the attribute OS, which is just character data. The term implied here, so you can either make it uh, implied, required, or none, I think. I'll have to check that. But uh, if you make it uh, required, then it must be there. Implied is basically saying it's optional. Either they can put it or they can't put it, but it doesn't matter either way to you. And you can see over here in my outline, this shows me what everything should look like. I should have softwares, that should reference software. Software should reference name, OS, price, and category, and have the attributes OS, price, and category. Name should have character data, OS, character data, price, character data, and on down the list. Um, and here's where it's wigging out. I think this is what's causing it to have problems. But you can tell that this is not, in fact, representative of reality. So shame on you, Eclipse. Anyway, and the glorious end result of all of that is this here. So the upside to this is that we have some sort of a sorting system, not a great one, but some sort. And we did that with um, just text. So we're not running uh, Eclipse, or excuse me, we're not running um, Apache. We're not running MySQL. We're not running PHP. This is just strictly text that's doing something for us already. So that's sort of the power of XML, and that's why it was very popular in the 90s um, and probably through about the mid-2000 region. It was uh, something you saw a lot, and this was why, because you didn't have to pay for uh, back end, you didn't have to pay for any sort of special stuff. Now this went away largely because as you're seeing here, everything I have on this computer is completely free. So first the open source movement giving you stuff like Ubuntu, MySQL, um, Eclipse, all these other great tools uh, meant that you could now have the software without having to buy it from Microsoft. Previously you had to buy this sort of software from Microsoft, uh, Oracle was another big player in the field, IBM, so because of that, it was expensive. With the open source movement, though, you can get very competitive software, or in some cases, even I'd argue better software, than what you would pay for. So that was a huge um, win, and that's one reason why XML started to fade out, because now you didn't just need to use text. The other thing that faded out was that um, JavaScript became popular, and in particular, a library of JavaScript called jQuery, and it made it easy to work with um, data that was being transmitted via the web, Ajax it's called, that took off in about 2006. Uh, the first thing that used Ajax was Google Maps, which is still around today. So because of these technological breakthroughs, some free and some just things that existed but were made better, and also the rise of um, uh, other software like Scriptalicious and uh, other stuff, uh, XML started to sort of fade to the background. That's kind of where it is today. It still exists, but it's not a commonly used technology. Then also PHP and Ruby on Rails and a lot of other back-end um, programming languages made this sort of operation really simple and does it much better than uh, what you can do with XML. In fact, if you want to do this right by XML, you would actually be using like integer data, which it could understand better than character data. But that's that. So the next part of the assignment is to use Visio to create a model relationship. And I'm not a fan of Visio and I'm not a fan of uh, this in particular because we actually have MySQL Workbench on this computer, and which uh, I'll be giving out in class. And what it allows you to do, as you can see right here, is it allows you to um, create entity relationships. And the way this works is that I can click here and place a table, double click on it, that'll pop up its name right here, so I can say that this table should be 
my table, which is a terrible name, but you know that works. And then for the column, the first thing it's going to pick is a primary key. So it's primary key, um, unique, yes, and unsigned. And uh, you don't want to assign a default value to it. So what does all this say? Primary key means that this, whenever another table references it, it should be looking at this. Um, UK, unique, that basically means um, that it must have a unique value because this is what everything else is going to look up. It can't conflict with another label. Uh, NN means not null, so you must have an integer put in here. By making it primary key, it's already going to do that. Over here, auto increment, that's something else. That just means that it goes one, two, three, four, five. So each time you make a new entry into here, it's automatically going to update. By just putting it as primary key, all the rest of them apply. It automatically has to be not null. It has to be unique. The only one that um, we selected here that's different is unsigned. An unsigned integer, if uh, this wasn't covered, is an integer that starts off at zero. It can't go negative. So a regular assigned integer can go negative or positive. An unsigned one can only go positive. And so then after that, we had our software name. Varkar is variable character. So uh, sending these character data, C data, and XML. This can go up to the value of 255. It cannot exceed that, though. You'll get an error if you attempt to make a var card go above this amount. There are other data types that will do it. But generally, if you're just um, doing something like this, we don't expect our software to have that verbose name. So you can set this down to a lower number, and that's perfectly fine. Anyway, so you can make this unique. Um, you can make sure that it's not null. Oops. Look at me, lying. You make this unique and not null. This cannot be, or this rather should not be, the primary key. That would be really a terrible idea. Uh, right here, bin binary. I think that means binary. I'll have to actually check it out. But I think this means binary. ZF is zero filled. I've never actually used that before, but uh, it's there. I don't know what it does. So don't ask. Um, default right here, if I wanted to make sure that if someone didn't fill in a name but it had something, I could put something like unnamed software. And then every time someone updated this without giving it a name, it would choose the name unnamed software. Not a great idea, but it is available. Then I could do price. Varkar 45 will work for us. You could make this an integer. It depends if you want to pass in the dollar sign or some sort of currency um, demarcator, or if you just want to pass in the raw data. For this one, since you're expecting it to have um, decimal places probably, if you do choose to have a decimal places, you use floating point type. Um, and you probably would want this to be not null as well. Then what else was category? So category, bar card 45 will work for us. And I don't think any of the other ones apply. And if they didn't put anything, you could just say named category. So this is how you build up your um, this is how you build up your uh, table. These indexes right here, we're not going to have time to cover this, but what an index does is that MySQL works on what's called a B tree relationship. So the best way to eh, I'll use Genie. So basically imagine you have 1,000 records. Uh, B tree binary, which is just 0 or 1, splits it up into you know, 0 through 499 and then 500 through 1,000 as its starting point. So it starts off at 1,000 and then it has a little grouping like this. So if you're saying I want to find the record that is 300, then it's going to skip over half of these records immediately. After that, it's then going to cut this in half. Actually, I think it should be 500 and 501 to 1,000. So that's immediately going to jump into this one, and it's going to say, OK, well, now we're going to half it again. So one side of it's going to be 0 through 250, and then the next side is going to be 251 through 500. And so then from there, if you have 300, it's going to say, OK, well, now we have 251 and 500, and we keep going on down the line until there's only one record left that matches. So that's what a B-tree lookup does. 
so instead of searching through 1,000 records and looping through all of them, it only searches six. So the upside to it is you get a major performance boost when you use um, indexes. The downside to indexes is that it has to create these B-tree lookups. So it has to create extra data on the server that holds this information on there. The downside to that being that if it does that, um, you just take up more and more server space. Uh, which for most modern servers that's not such a big deal anymore but you could run out of space and it depends upon how many rows and records you have how big these things are going to get. So anything that's labeled as having a key of some sort whether it's unique or a primary key these are the two big ones those will automatically get added into this list. The primary key always has one and ID table 1 being both unique and being the primary key has it but this one does as well because we gave it a key of unique. So uh, to link these things up, you got these different relationships, which we'll talk about at some point. But basically, you just click them, and it makes a connection. And so that's saying that this my table int is now being hooked up right here through that. So we now have a uh, primary key, which is being related to this as sort of its form, um, being related to this as its uh, foreign key. So primary key, foreign key. Again, we'll talk about all that in much greater detail in a later lesson, and we'll actually be in using it. But if you have to model stuff, you want to mock it up, then this is a better tool for it because it, it gives you a much better representation of what's going on than what you'll get out of um, Visio. And plus, this is real data. Like, this would actually be a real thing you would show someone, and they would understand how it works. Whereas, if you're doing it with Visio, then it's really not a real thing, and someone who uh, tries to use that may have unexpected results because it's not forcing you to label things, put indexes in, and all the other good stuff that you actually need to make a database. So this is a tool you'll be using. So anyway, that's, uh, that's your final lesson. Uh, once you complete that, you will have done everything you need to do. And in the next video, I will show you how you give me stuff.